Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Back when I was a fifth grade school teacher, um, I had to raise my voice in order to get the students to leave the coffee and sit down in their seats. Not that we had coffee. In fact, one year we didn't even have seats. But uh, that was kind of my standard approach, so it's really delightful. I I've often said that teaching fifth grade was the best training for Washington that I had because there's so much fifth grade behavior that goes on in this town. But it's a delight to be in the company of, of uh, adults for a change. Welcome to the Center for Strategic International Studies. On behalf of Dr. John Hamry, our CEO and President, I'm really grateful that you all are here today and I want to welcome as well our viewers on the web. We webcast and archive these events so that you can follow along with us at home or from the office if you had, you know, in fear of the snowstorm that's coming two days from now. You had to rearrange your schedule this morning. We'll see about that. Um, this series, the Military Strategy Forum, has been going on at CSIS now for almost a decade. Uh, we want to thank the generosity of our underwriters, uh, the Rolls-Royce North America, who has been our underwriter from the beginning. And we're grateful to them, as always, for their support to bring this series to us. Today is a little bit of a, of a different approach, if you will. Typically, these military strategy fora are, um, you know, the chiefs or the combatant commanders or the secretaries of the military departments, etc., and they're talking broader, grand strategy issues. Um, but we had an opportunity, and we thought it would be very useful to take advantage of it. Many of you were here um, just a few weeks ago, I think it was the 25th of January, when Dr. Murdoch ran an all-day session uh, in this very room on the QDR 2014 really looked back actually before the 1996 legislation that created the QDR it looked back to the bottom-up review as kind of the first QDR or even the evolution of the base force uh, uh, prior to that and, and followed through each QDR since then with lessons learned and I look out and I see a number of folks in the audience who were here for that day um, and this really springs from that discussion if you will um, we're welcome it's a a, a discussion series of the Military Strategy Forum. Is that my feedback? Or some echoing event here? Maybe it's just my ears playing tricks on me. Um, a discussion series on the QDR. And, uh, and this is really our, our kickoff, if you will. We're delighted uh, to, to have with us here today uh, General McKenzie to, uh, to start us off here. A couple of administrative notes. Uh, first of all, if you would silence your cell phones and uh, um, keep them off during the course of the event. That would be much appreciated. Um, secondly, when the way we're going to run this is uh, we'll turn the platform over to General McKenzie for his remarks. Um, and then he and I will have a short discussion on the stage here in the easy chairs. And then we'll open it up to the audience for questions. You should have received note cards uh, when you came in. Um, raise your hand if you did not get a note card, and the staff will get you one. Uh, you can write down questions. You can start writing them down now. You can write them down as, as we speak. Uh, raise your hand when you've got your questions written. They'll be collected by the staff. And we have two of our uh, senior scholars here in the front who are going to uh, uh, aggregate and, and uh, uh, rationalize those questions and make sure we get as many of them asked as possible. Uh, Dr. Marin Lead and Mr. Nate Fryer, uh, when the time comes, will be ably handling. They're also good at, if no questions arise at all, they got plenty that they have cooked up on their own. So it isn't that you get off uh, easy if, if you've paid everybody to say, don't ask any questions. I used to say that just because you don't ask questions doesn't mean you get out of class early. Uh, we're going we're gonna to finish up here no matter what. So we're delighted that our, our first uh, uh, speaker in this discussion series on the QDR is actually from the U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, General Frank McKenzie is the director of the uh, QDR office and the representative of the, QD, uh, of the Marine Corps to the QDR. I think he actually sat in our audience on QDR day uh, uh, through pretty much the whole day as we went through that uh, process back in January. And, uh, um, and of course, this is a most interesting time to be undertaking a QDR, um, probably as, uh, more interesting and more convoluted than any time anything we've done since probably the bottom-up review in pre-QDR days. So, Please join me in a warm round of welcome for General Frank McKenzie. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, 
good to be back over at CSIS. I did uh, come out for that full day session about a month ago, and, and it was uh, it was actually very interesting. Uh, QDR season is is upon us, and uh, each service has an officer like me. Many of them were here at the, the session a couple of weeks or a month ago when we uh, when we had that very informative, very thoughtful, very insightful series of series of briefs. Uh, let me just tell you how I how I got the job. It might be might be interesting to you how how the Marine Corps selects people to do this. Uh, this spring, I, last last spring, I was the CENTCOM J5, the Director of Strategy, Plans, and Policy at U.S. Central Command, and happy in my work, and uh, thought I was going to California to be the Deputy Commander of One Mef, our our large formation on the West Coast. Happy with those orders. It's a great house. My wife was looking forward to it, and uh, uh, I was actually at our Ford headquarters in uh, in Cutter, and uh, got a phone call and said, "Look, the Commandant wants to talk to you," and uh, I know that. Comment I talking to major generals, not normally a good thing. And then they said, and he wants to Tanberg. And uh, so I knew it was really going to be bad. So he set up a Tanberg. He, he, he got me on the hook and said, Frank, I just want to look in the eyes when I tell you this. You're going to do QDR for the Marine Corps. And uh, it was not phrased in the form of a question uh, <laughs> in, in any way. But, uh, but I do have a little bit of QDR experience. Uh, back in 99, I was very lucky after battalion command to spend uh, 18 months working for Michelle Flournoy over at the National Defense University in a QDR study group that, uh, that she stood up. So that was my first experience with it, and it was just, it was a fantastic experience. Made a lot of friends, met, met some of the people that are, that are in this room uh, today, uh, actually, during that, during that time. Then I went on back into the Marine Corps and did a little bit of QDR, then went on and, and had hoped that they would forget that, but, uh, but they did not forget that. And uh, so here I stand before you. Uh, so it's QDR season. Uh, uh, here again in, in DC, um, you know, it, it, it typically in the past we might have already been underway to generate a report that's ultimately due to ultimately due to Congress in February of 2014. So now, really, it's 11 months away that that that, that the report's going to be due. Probably uh, not surprising that it's been delayed because. You know, I, I, I believe, we believe that probably what they're waiting on was, was for Secretary of Defense to be, to be, uh, to be nominated and to, and to take office. That has happened, and I think that's probably the, the significant factor that will now sort of allow OSD policy and the, and the, rest, of the, uh, uh, the rest of the OSD establishment to begin to make real plans about QDR. And, and I think we'll begin to see some, begin to see some movement uh, on that as we go forward. You know, don't know exactly what the shape of this QDR is going to be. The, the, you know, the briefings we had in here a few weeks ago were profoundly informative. Uh, I, I, it, is, it, is, uh, it, it could go either large or small. It could, fill the, it could fulfill the congressional mandate, which is to look out 20 years, do a strategy-driven review of the, of the department uh, from top to bottom. It could be something else. Uh, actually, over the past four QDRs and the bottom-up review and base force that preceded the work we're on now, there have been a variety of different approaches and a variety of different levels of success. Um, I would just briefly tell you that, you know, that obviously the base force and the bottom-up review that followed the 1990-91 and the 92-93 efforts, uh, for my service, they, they gave us the force that we have today. We, you know, we ended up in the mid-170s, and we stayed pretty much at that force level for the intervening over 30 years, except when we ramped up for sustained ground combat in Iraq and in Afghanistan over the last decade. And we're going back down to a number of, a, of about 182 is, is, is where I, we think our own analysis leads us that we'll, that we'll probably end up. So those are very, those, those two initial studies that are sort of the, the parents of the congressionally mandated QDR, you know, are, are, we think were, were actually very, very important. There have been four QDRs since then. Some have been more important than others. I, I think the 2001 QDR could have been of great significance had 9-11 not occurred and it's run off the tracks as we, as we actually went to war uh, following, the, uh, following those attacks in September of 2011. Uh, so a lot of different opinions on what the QDR is going to be. I, I will actually take a minute to read to you a couple of lines from testimony given uh, the HASC had a QDR hearing last week. And they're two very, very smart guys with a couple of different opinions on, uh, on, on QDR. First, I'll quote Sean Brimley, who says, the 2014 QDR should therefore use the 2012 Defense Strategic Guidance as the baseline strategy and focus on how to best implement that strategy over 20 years at various plausible levels of resources and risks. Okay, Sean's opinion. Then Jim Thomas, at the same hearing, says, 
It is difficult, however, to imagine the pro a process less suited to developing good strategy than a QDR, a highly bureaucratic process involving thousands of people uh, that results in an unclassified report that is read by our foes and friends alike. Uh, I think it's, there's, you know, there's, there's truth in both, those, in both those statements. And we just don't know the way this, uh, this QDR is actually going to go. I would tell you this. Um, there are a couple of factors that, that everyone in this room is aware of that I think tend to argue this potentially could be an important QDR. First, you have a new secretary. And he has a finite amount of time, as all secretaries do, in which he can put his imprint on the department. He has a mechanism at hand that he could use to, he could use to do some things should he, use, should he choose to make decisions through the venue of the QDR. Not all past secretaries have chosen to do that. In fact, under some past secretaries, the QDR has done its work and the secretary has made decisions, resource decisions, strategy decisions, in other venues and through other mechanisms. But should the secretary choose to use the QDR to that, to, to that end, then he's got a tool that is ready-made for him to use. Second point that argues for perhaps uh, this maybe being a meaningful QDR is the fact that we do have a relatively new strategy on the street. It's a little over a year old, and I'm referring, of course, to, to the Defense Strategic Guidance, the uh, January 2012 DSG, which modified the existing uh, national security strategy and is actually, uh, from my services perspective, a pretty useful and informative document and, and one that we find it effective to plan to. Uh, so that, there's a relatively new strategy that's on the table. And of course, the last thing is the elephant in the room, the fiscal, the fiscal issues that you're all aware of that are certainly going certainly to constrain anything you want to do. So I think, taken all together, it argues that we have the possibility for this to be a significant QDR. It'll be as important, uh, it'll be as, important as the Secretary wants it to be when it's all said and done. Uh, you know, and, and I think it's probably going to have to examine the current strategy. We're going to have to see, can the, can the DSG, the provisions of the DSG, the shift to the, shift to the Pacific, and, and, and I won't recite the list, but you're all aware of the 10 mission areas and the other, uh, the, the, the other things that the DSG calls out, are we going to be able to execute that strategy? Are we going to be able to execute it at a higher level of risk? Uh, are, we going to be, or are we going to have to change the aspirational goals of the strategy? So those are, that is perhaps a, a you know a good way that the you know that, that the QDR uh, could actually start. In fact, I would argue that a, that a QDR could do, could do three things that would that would be useful. Uh, first is validate the existing strategy, as I just mentioned. I don't think you write a new strategy with the QDR because the QDR is signed by the Secretary of Defense and goes to Congress. The DSG and the National Security Strategy is signed by the President. So it's a different level. But what you can do is you can use the QDR mechanism to examine that strategy and go back to the President and say, look, we're not resourced to execute the, the vision that you have, or we can do it, but it's going to be at a higher level of risk. Or perhaps there are some things that, that we would need to modify. So that's one, that's one thing a QDR could look at. I think going down another level and, and, and something that we've spent a lot of time looking at is it's time to look at the, uh, the balance of our forward deployed forces and those forces that are going to be stationed at home. How much the forward deployed forces cost? What is it they actually do for the nation? Uh, we would argue that, that they deter, they do a number of things, and I'll dig into that here in just a minute. But I think it's a discussion worth having. Uh, and that's something that the QDR could take a look at. Our third thing a QDR could take a look at is the ACRC mix, the active component, reserve component mix. A lot of studies have been done, a lot of, uh, a lot of swirl on that right now. But those, the last two things are certainly something that falls right, right into the ma mainstream of what a, potential, what a potential QDR could take a look at. So that's sort of my thinking on the overall QDR. What I'd like to do now is sort of shift gears just a little bit and talk about the Marine Corps and how we see ourselves as we enter the QDR. And I'm not going to talk about a QDR strategy because we don't have one. Uh, what we do have actually is, is the Marine Corps strategy and uh, the decisions that we've made and the policies that we've implemented to support the DSG and the National Military Strategy. And that becomes in effect your QDR strategy. It becomes your long-term uh, strategic vision, your service strategic vision, and it sort of defines how you plan to answer questions as you go into the QDR. So, turning to the Marine Corps, we see ourselves as a force that's built on forward presence. Uh, we see ourselves as a force that is forward deployed, probably largely rotationally, but not exclusively rotationally. Uh, it's going to be a ready force, and that will be a theme I will come back to. Wh whatever the final force level for Marines are, if it's 182,000 or it's 6,000, it's going to be a ready force. And we define readiness as a, re a ready force, as a force that can act this afternoon, today. Not a week from now, not two weeks from now, 
but from top to bottom is ready to go. That's an aspirational goal. Sometimes we fall short, but we work very hard uh, to implement that policy across the service. What we will not accept is a hollowed force, and we won't accept tiered readiness. Those are not, uh, those are not visions that are consistent with the, with the Marine Corps' view of, uh, uh, of itself. So a forward deployed force, a force that can act today, a force that can be uh, the backbone of conventional deterrence. Uh, we think that's, that's sort of the Marine Corps that we see. Able to act in crisis response on very short notice. And the point I'd make about crisis response is you got to be there to be effective in crisis response. You actually have to be there. You can't virtually be there. You can come later to do other things, but if you're going to be active on day one or, or D plus one or D plus two, you're going to have to have forces that can, that can reach out and do that very quickly. So that's another, that's another element that we would describe ourselves. Some of you have heard the Commandant use the, use the phrase middleweight force. And I think that's, a, that's actually a very, a very good phrase to describe where we think we live on the continuum of military action. Uh, it's, it, we think we're day to day in the theater, the ability to get in, to uh, act uh, as a crisis response force, to buy time for decision makers, and to buy time for the larger joint force of which we're, we're a core component uh, to react and to bring forces forward. That's the definition of a middleweight force. We don't, uh, we don't train exclusively to fight at the high end because we've got the best army in the world that's going to be capable of doing that. But what we think we do is buy time for that army to deploy, and then we're going to have the capability to cooperate and integrate with that army should we have to fight a sustained land campaign. But that is not the heart of the service vision. The heart of the service vision is deterrence forward, ability to Presumably, in phase zero and one, for those of you who are familiar with the way we look at, at, at planning document, ability to deter, ability to shape, to prevent crises from occurring, and then to react very quickly should those, should those crises occur. And then if you have to go to a, higher, uh, to a higher end response, the ability to be effective and to reach out and, and to do that as well. And that leads me to just uh, sort of an aside. I, I am fascinated by, by deterrence theory, and I, the Department of Defense does a lot, has done down through the years a lot of really good work on nuclear deterrence and thinking about large-scale deterrence. I am not sure that we have, have, have done as much thinking as we should about conventional deterrence and the role of four deployed forces in, in that deterrence concept. Even the models largely that we use tend to overlook that and it's because, for one thing, it's very hard to measure. It's, 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 a, it's hard to get a quantitative answer to, to to many of those questions. It's a qualitative issue, I would argue. So it's hard, it's hard sometimes to find that. But I think we need, probably need to do a better job of taking a look at, at, you know, at what, uh, at what uh, conventional deterrence means. Let me give you an example of how the Marine Corps sees itself and, and how we see ourselves going forward. Some of you may be aware of the Crisis Response Special Purpose MAGTAP. It's an idea that's working and floating out there to deploy uh, small Marine ground, air ground task forces forward on COCOM requirements to be able to act quickly to protect American citizens. Uh, Benghazi is, is, is an example of a situation where that might have been applicable to do uh, non-combatant evacuation operations or to do tactical recovery of aircraft and personnel. A broad range of missions, a relatively small force, not a Marine Expeditionary Unit, which is the large, uh, very mobile, highly capable, typically sea-based force that's sort of the crown jewel of Marine Corps crisis response and forward deployment. Rather, the Crisis Response Special Purpose MAGTAP, which is still evolving, is a capability that can be land-based forward. Uh, it can be a hybrid model. You might have part of it uh, afloat, part of it ashore, but it's going to be very flexible. And when you, you know, when you put V-22 Ospreys on it, couple it with the ability to extend the range of those aircraft with C-130Js, you have the capability to put Marines over a huge radius very quickly. So that's an example of something that is, is, is in our thinking as we go forward based on a demand signal from the, from the combatant commanders. Um, another element I'll, I'll come back to, I've already talked a little bit about it, is the fact that in order to do these things, you have to be ready. Uh, you, you, you cannot accept tiered readiness. Uh, and that will cause us, again, as we look at whatever the, the force structure of the Marine Corps is going to be, that force structure is going to be a ready force structure. And we view that as absolutely, absolutely critical to, to, uh, to what we're going to be. And that leads me to my next point, I'll just talk briefly about the end strength of the Marine Corps. We're coming down from a high of 202,000 uh, to support large-scale ground combat operations in Iraq, now complete, and in Afghanistan, from which we're now, which we're now drawing down. We're on a glide slope to go to 182,000. That's a number that we arrived at uh, through rigorous study, through a couple of formal uh, study efforts, the uh, 
Force Structure Review Group of a couple of years ago, and more recently a group called the FORGE, the Force Optimization Review Group, where we look at you know, what, what, what are the tasks the Marine Corps has under the, uh, under the National Military Strategy and under the COCOM requirements. What are those tasks? How do we best configure the Marine Corps to accomplish that? And that's led us to believe that 182 is a good number. Actually, we would prefer to have been at 186, but, we're, but uh, we were directed to go to 182, and that's the number that we're at now. And we think it, it, that, that we're going to be able to accomplish the task that we've been given at that number. Now, in the future, who knows if that number is going to be the, the, the final number for the Marine Corps. I certainly don't know the answer to that. But, but I would tell you this, whatever number it's going to be at, it's going to be a ready force. And the other point I would make allied to that is, for Marines, there's no red line on, on numbers. Uh, we're eventually going to produce the best Marine Corps we can produce for the American people based on the resources that we're given. We happen to think right now we can make a strong argument for 182. But as we go forward, as the QDR grinds forward, and as, as other things become evident over, over the months ahead, we'll see where we, where we, finally, uh, where we finally end up. We're going to have to remain partnered with the U.S. Navy uh, as, we, as we go forward. Uh, we, uh, we maneuver on amphibious warships. Uh, and an amphibious warship is not a, it's not a commercial vessel. It's not a, uh, it's, it's not a lift ship, a ship simply designed to move you from, from one point to another. An amphibious warship is a vessel that, if I could paraphrase Winston Churchill, you know, is designed to go under fire. It's supposed to be shot at and it's supposed to be able to, it's supposed to, be able to survive in a non-permissive environment. So the Navy's numbers of amphibious warships are very important to us, and we work closely with them you know, to, to monitor that number. We understand that they, amphibious warships are one element of a balanced fleet, and the Navy has a number of critical demands on maintaining that balanced fleet. Nonetheless, amphibious warships allow you to maneuver to conduct forcible entry, and I'll talk just a little bit more about that in a minute, as well as the ability to do scalable presence operations to deter with forward-based forces. You don't get that if you're, if you're riding on a merchant sea lift ship, although you can certainly use merchant sea lift ships to do other things uh, as well. It's just not, it's never going to be equivalent to an amphibious, uh, to an amphibious warship. And sort of lays the groundwork for, for, for discussion of forcible entry. Uh, we believe the nation needs a forcible entry capability. You need the capability to enter another nation uh, when they don't want you to come in. It's, it's ultimately one of the highest forms of conventional deterrence. Uh, we have trained to that standard for many years, uh, and we don't see it as you know, the forcible entry, the amphibious operation of World War II. It's not an Iwo Jima. It's not a Normandy. It's not that thing. It's the ability to uh, enter uh, where the enemy isn't, preferably, or through suppressing part of his defenses. It's the ability to reach deep inland with V-22s. It's the ability to, to, to cross a beach and get off that beach and move inland. We don't see fighting for beachheads anymore. We, there are a variety of ways to avoid that fight. But nonetheless, when it's all said and done, we would argue this nation needs a requirement, needs a capability to enter, uh, some, enter ground that is, is denied to you. And that's the forcible entry capability that we bring. And we, don't, we recognize we don't bring that alone. We bring that as part of the joint force and probably going to require joint assistance to do a number of these things. But nonetheless, it's a requirement, and it, and it, leads, to, uh, it leads to other requirements. It'll lead to some equipment requirements that I'll come back and, and, and talk to here in, uh, here in just a little bit. Another point that uh, the Marine Corps is going to carry forward with, we think, as we, as we go into the QDR, is our history of flexibility and innovation. You know, Pete Ellis wrote a... Uh, wrote a paper in the early 20s, Advanced Force Operations in Micronesia, that sort of became, at least for Marines, a primer for the way that operations in the Pacific were carried out during the Second World War. Uh, if you look at the tactical problem in the Western Pacific, that's a problem that's going to be solved through dispersion, uh, advanced base operations, and VSTAL capabilities, because many of the long runways under a lot of circumstances could be denied to you. And so we think that's an excellent example of where the Marine Corps is going to have a unique capability to play uh, as we go forward. Uh, and I would commend uh, Pete Ellis' study to you. It's, it's available out there. It's worth taking a look at. I think it was written in, 19, uh, in 1922. So finally, equipment. Uh, the V-22 is now operational. It's flown, uh, it's flown in combat twice. Uh, it's been very effective there. It's now flying in the Western Pacific. We're deploying it routinely from Okinawa to Guam. It has the capability to self-deploy really from Okinawa to uh, Australia with aerial refueling or, or, uh, or stops for fuel en route. It's a capability that you know, a few years back uh, you know, was under, we were under a lot of attack for that aircraft. 
we would argue it's an aircraft that's proved itself. It's fundamental to our ability to reach inland and, uh, and carry out forcible entry, ability to maneuver, real ability to do HADR operations, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief operations. V-22 gives you greater range, greater capability, enormous flexibility. It's a program that we fought for uh, against high odds at, at, at different times, but it's come to fruition and we think it's an example of, a, of an innovative, spectacularly transformational aircraft. We have another aircraft that's out there in the F-35B uh, that, is, that is still uh, in its developmental process, although we're beginning to feel the aircraft and, and think we'll probably have a, a squadron in the Western Pacific and I believe FY17 is going to be, is going to be the plan. Uh, the F-35 has a number of things to argue for it. It's, it's, it's an integrated intelligence gathering platform. Uh, it can do a lot of things. It can do a lot of penetration type things. But I, would, I come back to uh, the unique capability that the B has to take off vertically and the fact that in most significant contingencies as we look forward, it's going to be hard to hold long runways. It's going to be hard to maintain pristine 7,500 foot runways. And therefore, the force that's going to be able to go V-stall, the force that's going to be able to operate from an austere expeditionary environment is going to have inherent advantages and is going to be less, held less at risk by, by somebody who's firing ballistic missiles at you and is going to be able to get at you with relatively cheap and high number of, uh, uh, of missiles that are going to put your runways at risk. The last platform that we've got out there that, that we're taking a hard look at right now is the replacement for our amphibious tractor fleet, the AAV. Uh, which is a good vehicle. It's been around a long time. It was, it was an, a moderately aged vehicle when I came into the Marine Corps as a second lieutenant. We managed to, to upgrade it and it's still a, still a good workhorse vehicle. But as part of our integrated ground vehicle fleet going forward, we're looking at a replacement for it. Now, uh, the, the expeditionary fighting vehicle has been canceled, um, but there are a lot of lessons learned from the expeditionary fighting vehicle. Uh, sometimes a, you know, a defeat teaches you a lot of, a lot of, a lot of good lessons. And we are now looking at what we want the amphibious combat vehicle, the follow-on to the AAV to look like. <clears throat> Pardon me. Because we think we need it. We think we need it to be, able to, uh, to be able to come ashore, to be able to operate inland. And not only at the high end, it gives you enormous flexibility and speed for hostage, uh, or correction, for uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations as well. So there are a lot of things that this vehicle will bring us. And so we're looking at it very hard. We have not yet finalized exactly what the requirements for that vehicle are going to be because we're very much aware that we need to get the vehicle right. We need, to, we need to make sure that we've thought through and have absorbed all the lessons of the EFV. So when we do go forward to industry with it, we're going to have uh, a package that's going to be, uh, first of all, affordable, and second, it's going to give us the, the operational capabilities that, that we think we're going to need. So those are the three equipment things that, uh, that, I, thought I'd just, that I, I, I thought I'd throw out at the end and I could talk a little bit more, uh, a little bit more about that as well. So that, that, that concludes my prepared remarks this morning. I've touched on a number of things. And probably the most useful thing for all of us will be whatever questions you, you want to have and I'll be certainly uh, very happy to entertain those. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. While they're uh, removing the podium there, um, I got a host of questions and notes that I took as you were talking. And it, it strikes me that, uh, that you bring a lot to this job that a QDR needs. You've got the combat experience, you've got the joint experience, you've got the command experience. But in many ways, those are all just elements that, that lead up to a larger picture. You alluded to the connection to the strategy and how while it's not going to drive the strategy, it has to validate the strategy, which of course may change while you're in the middle of this QDR process. If you go back to the defense strategic guidance that was issued last January, um, almost immediately you had commentary from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs on down that um, a reduction in funding would require a revisit of the strategy, if you will. Um, to some, that says your strategy's got to fit your funding. You've been involved in the discussions all along about whether or not the QDR ought to be fiscally constrained. We used that word fiscally <coughs> informed last time. I'm not quite sure what informed means in that regard. But we also know that at the working group level, a lot of QDR efforts are, in fact, fiscally constrained as part of that process. It's just when you roll it up to the final product. How do you address the question of fiscal constraints as you're thinking about preparing for this QDR, particularly with the uncertainty of whether the strategy may change or be modified along the way? 
Obviously, at some point, if, if resources diminish significantly, you're not going to be able to execute the strategy that's before us now. Don't know where that knee in the curve is. Uh, I think we're going to look very hard at that. And I, I would think that kind of examination would be a useful precursor or first stage for, for a QDR. You need to try to find that point. Because you, know, you, you can stay with a strategy at some level. And there are advantages to staying with a strategy, if at all possible. It's, it's, you know, it's only a year old. It's signed by the president. It's a good sign of continuity if you can find a way to continue to execute the core components of that strategy, even during a period of fiscal pressure. You may not be able to do that. And I, I don't know where that point is. We all, I think, recognize there is such a point. Just, and I, but I think that's something useful that you could, you could discover at the very beginning. I also believe that certainly uh, the QDR is going to have to be informed, driven, uh, choose whatever words you like, you know, by fiscal reality. And I think it, that's why this QDR could be particularly useful if that's the case. And you know, we we just don't know. We'll see uh, what you know as OSD considers how they want to move ahead and and recognizing as as we all do that it is an OSD driven process. You know, services participate. We're eager to participate, but nonetheless, you know, it ultimately will be the secretary's report. You know, in connecting the QDR and the strategy to the programs in DoD, um, those of us who have been at this for a while recognize that one of the real strengths of DoD is the FIDIP, is the, the future year defense program and mm -hmm. the fiscally disciplined programming process that goes in with that. And this has served, as you pointed out, the Marine Corps in very good stead, really from the time of the base force on, on forward. Um, the timing of this is really kind of interesting because you've already wrapped up the 14 to 19 FIDIP, perhaps not connected to what the final resources are going to mm -hmm. be. We'll see that play out as the rest of this year goes by. Um, you don't really update that again. You might update it for 15 to 19 in a 15 budget. But the next real guidance for a FIDIP is about two months after this next QDR is finished. In other words, you'll wrap up this QDR and deliver it to the Congress about February of 2014. Along about April of 2014, you'll be issuing the internal guidance for the, 15, the 16 to 21 FIDIP. The first FIDIP that will be post-Afghanistan, post-Iraq. The first one that will be post whatever deal we end up with in terms of funding. Do you aim the QDR at that FIDIP and at, at being the basis for the guidance for that FIDIP going forward? I think you could. Um, you know, the report's due in February of 2014. Historically, the QDR, QDR is finished before then, mm -hmm. so they can be, you know, coordinated, massaged. I, yeah. I think that's probably possible. You know, I think that obviously that's a, that's a decision that will be made in the Secretariat uh, as they look at it. That's certainly something that you could aim for. And, it, and then, you know, you begin to connect programmatic reality to it, one of the criticisms of past QDRs. It allows you to hang something to it at the very end, which might, again, argue for a significant QDR. Then let me back from that, because you mentioned phase zero and Marine Corps flexible and, and, and ability to operate in austere environments and dispersed environments in a phase zero kind of a sense. When we did our study last summer of the, of the possibilities of a pivot to Asia, force posture change for PACOM, mm -hmm. Marine Corps clearly plays a very strong role there, not just because of the movement of Marines to, from Okinawa to Guam and Australia and the creation of the four dispersed MAGTAFs, but at the phase zero end, enormous opportunity with dozens of countries around the regions for engagement at a host of levels from humanitarian assistance and disaster response all the way up. The problem is that the recognition of the value of that force structure is usually only valid if it's attached to a major war plan and a phase two, phase three kind of kinetics. You got a challenge of phase zero operations that are no longer attached to any longer term higher escalation piece, if you will. How do you wrestle with that? Because it's not really a resource issue. How do you wrestle with that inside something like a QDR? You know, the, the department models high in war really well. Looks at, looks at uh, MCO, relationships between MCO, force demand for MCO, and, and post MCO stability operations pretty well. The uh, department has not. I would argue measured very effectively the phase zero, phase one. We're going to we're going to carry that argument forward, and we'll see if it if it gains traction or not. But I do take your point that it has not been well measured historically by the department from a quantitative sense, and that tends to ultimately inform four structure decisions. So maybe as the defense strategic guidance flows through this QDR, it'll give you both the requirement and the opportunity to create that framework and allow you to validate and justify that use of forces as a design parameter. We think it's a great opportunity to do that, and I think everyone would agree if you can stay at phase zero, phase one, that's where you'd like to stay for a host of reasons. For, for the rest of our lives, if we could, absolutely. My final question, then I'm going to go to the questions that are being turned in. I see there's a lot of note cards already coming in there. You know, I can see why the 
commandant would pick you to do this, right? Your, your, one of your roles is to protect your service. Another of your role is to be prepared to offer what your service can offer as the QDR evolves. But in some ways, is there a third role, which is really to look for opportunities that nobody could anticipate, if you will, and figure out how to take advantage of those opportunities in real time as this is unfolding. Is that a role that you see for yourself, and how do you prepare for that role? Well, there are a lot of smart guys in the Marine Corps that are, that are looking at that. I, I, would, I would throw out, uh, no kidding, the, the special purpose MACTAF concept we're tinkering with right now, which has uh, been born very quickly and is moving forward and we think is going to actu actually answer a very real need on very short notice for, for combatant commanders forward. But yes, short answer is yes, but many, many smart people, much smarter than me, will be looking at that. And that special purpose MACTAF, you could scale up, scale down? Scale up, scale size. down. It'll, it'll begin small and uh, could stay small, could get larger could, could uh, will initially probably be land-based, but it's going to have the, uh, the ability to operate partially at sea to be a hybrid model as well. You know, as we go along, as we gain experience with it, practical, real-world experience, we'll determine, you know, how best to employ it. It could dovetail nicely with the phase zero, phase one. We think so, absolutely. Well, that's uh, really quite good. Let me turn now um, to our, our audience's questions. Uh, Nate Fryer, Dr. Martin Lead, uh, how do you guys want to proceed? You've, have you figured out amongst yourselves who's going first? And you've got a mic, so you're ready to go. General, thanks for being here. Uh, we really appreciate your insights. Um, first question I'll start out with, I think um, it's, it's connected. A number of people have asked about the concept of risk and where, you, where the department should or can take risk. Um, specifically, uh, we seem to be entering a period where traditional, as you put it, MCO considerations are actually rising in prominence with the DSG. Uh, the deter defeat mission is clearly focused on, on that. And we're leaving a period where we spend a, lot, a great deal of time on irregular uh, challenges and operations. I'd like to first get your view on where the Marine Corps sits on the risk balance between those two, and second, sort of how you feel uh, the department should look at that as well. Sure. Um, first of all, I, I think the department needs to take a very nuanced look at risk in that different elements of the department are going to take different levels of risk when applied to different planning contingencies. Now, to t take that directly to the Marine Corps, based on what I've said this morning, I think it's obvious that the Marine Corps is going to accept a lot higher level of risk in MCO operations. Uh, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna build a force, we would like to build a force to do forward presence, to do crisis response, to do that middle weight, uh, to do that middle weight response. We don't, uh, we don't say we're not gonna play in an MCO because we wanna be there and we think we bring something very real and very capable to the fight, as we've seen amply demonstrated over the last 10 years. But nonetheless, as we look at our structure and our, our force, we believe that you, know, you can't, particularly in a time of austerity, and we're entering that period of austerity, you can't do everything. All forces can't do all things. So that's where the department writ large could perhaps take a, a, you know, a very discriminating look at what forces they want to take, what risk, what risk at what level. And for the Marine Corps, as I've already described, you know, we would try to minimize risk in our presence and our crisis response uh, capabilities, and we'd accept a slightly higher level of risk uh, in, in MCO and higher end. Sir, thanks for being here. Uh, there's a question here about the uh, importance of forcible entry, which you discussed, and whether or not there are any or should be any initiatives focused on better integrating Army Airborne Forceful Entry Capabilities, Special Operations, and Marine Corps Capabilities? I, I think the Joint Operational Access concept, the Joint Staff is actually, we, we are participating and taking a look at that. Uh, so yes, I would say, you, I mean, that's, that, that's, that's a pretty straightforward, uh, that's a pretty straightforward response. There are going to be places in forcible entry, you know, where amphibious forces are not going to be relevant just like there are gonna be places and locales where air, airborne forces aren't gonna be relevant. And then there are gonna be places, perhaps a lot of places, where you can, use, you can apply elements of both of them. And you know, we certainly would, certainly would welcome that and, and we'll have no, no issue with that. I think we rolled out the JOAC here about a year ago and are still eagerly waiting for the follow-on pieces to that as they come forward. Maybe they'll wait until after the QDR. <laughs> The audience has uh, asked another couple of questions on the, the linkage between the Army and the Marine Corps. Um, clearly, there's been a relationship that's been forged over the last 12 years between the two services and the extended operations in the greater Middle East. And the question is, going forward, how do you see the Army and the Marine Corps sort of 
codifying what they've learned over the last 12 years and also cooperating on, you know, a vision for the future of ground operations sure. as well. As you said, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of close interaction between the Army and the Marine Corps over the last over the last decade. I, I've commanded soldiers in combat and I've had soldiers lead me in combat in a couple of different places. So we've got a very close relationship with the Army. However, the fact of the matter is the Marine Corps is naval. We're a naval force. That's the, those are our roots, and we're going to continue to emphasize that as we go forward. The Army is the, the force of decisive action for the United States of America in a, in a, in a land campaign. It, it's the heavy force that's going to come and, and, and ultimately win the land war. The Marine Corps is not going to do that, uh, although we can certainly uh, participate in those large land campaigns. The Marine Corps, as a naval force, is going to be the force that will buy time for the Army to deploy, uh, perhaps uh, do a variety of things to shape the early battle space to allow the Army to enter. Uh, but we are not a second land Army, to use a phrase that, that, you, that you hear a lot uh, here in the, last, uh, in, the, in the last few months. We're not that. We're a naval force. Very different capabilities. Although we have had the capability to work very closely with them over the last few years in campaigns that are actually pretty far, pretty far from the water. about uh, sort of what some might call niche capabilities. Uh, one, on the contributions of Marine Corps civil affairs in phase zero and phase one, and how you see that uh, evolving over time. And then also one about uh, Marine Corps cyber and how you see uh, cyber forces and Marine Corps contributions in cyber changing future warfare. Sure, MAR4 Cyber is gonna be an element of the Marine Corps going forward. We're still looking at what the final contribution of Marines is gonna to be to that. But, but I can tell you as a former J5 and a combatant command, cyber considerations fundamentally uh, permeate every bit of operational planning that you do. You think about it from beginning to end. So it's so interwoven in everything you do, it's really not, it's really not separate. We're not as good at it as we need to be yet, we're gonna get better. Uh, and the Marine Corps recognizes this, and so you're going to see Marines, significant numbers of Marines, and I don't know what the final number is going to be because we're still looking at it, but the Marine Corps, is going to, Marine Corps is going to have a seat at the table in cyber, and we're going to make the contribution necessary to have that seat at the table as we go forward. Now for uh, Marine Civil Affairs, that's another uh, structure issue that we're looking at in the Force Optimization Review Group uh, as we go forward. Clearly, Phase 0, Phase 1, great opportunity for, for those guys and gals to be, to be effective. Uh, don't know exactly ultimately where they're going to reside, what the reserve active component mix is going to be, uh, but we're looking at it. There's a, another question here on um, outsourcing and contract support for the Marine Corps. Um, the question really is the idea that the Army does make up a lot of a lot of gaps in in uh, some of its capability through contracting and um, outsourcing. Um, there's, the question is, is, is the Marine Corps looking for more or less opportunities in that regard? Um, and, and how does it see that in expeditionary operations, in particular the relationship between contractors and, and regular forces? Yeah, that is not a subject that I am an expert on. But I am, I know a little bit about uh, the standard that we want to have for support in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in an austere expeditionary environment, which is about 30 days. And we look for that to be self-sustained. You're going to have very minimal contract support during that period of time. So that's probably the best way that I could answer that question. You know, anything we do in terms of contracting, particularly in a, in a forward area, in a combat zone, is going to be made with an eye to frugality, austerity, and ability to act uh, very quickly. You and David discussed this to some degree, the relationship between the QDR and the budget. Um, it was the, I, I think David has a somewhat um, optimistic underpinning assumption that we might actually get to clarity um, that could inform the QDR's efforts. We have a question here about uh, if that might not occur. Is it possible to plan uh, when, you, in, when you have a budget crisis every year or multiple times a year? How do you handle that if you don't have at least some reliable outlook for the future as you undertake this effort? Well, if, if you plan multiple scenarios. You plan to a band of outcomes. Uh, it's harder to plan like that, but we can do it. You know, we can change from the quadrennial defense review to the quarterly defense <laughs> review, and that would probably allow us to keep up, if you will, right? <laughs> and 
that standing bureaucracy has got to do something in between uh, the four years. Uh, of course, what it does for your career, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Nate? So um, where does the Marine Corps have potential capability that it might have too much? It might have too much capability or has over the last 12 years uh, gained more than it, than it needs? And, and where does it specifically not have enough? Sure. Um, well, we had 202,000 Marines when we were fighting two large land wars. You know, the product of the Marine Corps is the individual Marine. And so we're now drawing down to, we're drawing down 20,000 Marines. We're shedding excess capability. Uh, that 182 force is a pretty lean force. There's not a lot of fat in there. So we would argue that we have made those cuts coming down to 182. Uh, and, you know, we may have to look at it anew based on a resource picture that, you know, is yet completely, un not completely developed. And we'll see how that shakes out. But we would argue that we've shed, you know, a number of capabilities, and, per and particularly with our end strength as we come down. I would note that it's been our advantage here uh, at CSIS that you've slowed down your accessions because we regularly get really good interns who are waiting sure. for their basic and, uh, <laughs> and they get to spend a little time with us here. So you can, you can keep doing that for a while. It's fine with us. Uh, you talked about the importance of and emphasize the Marine Corps as a maritime force. Um, but if the Navy is unable to sustain the rotational schedules that support mm -hmm. you deploying. Um, you also talked a little bit about Marines being also uh, forward deployed <coughs> on, in the ground, on the ground side. At that point, if it becomes clear that the Navy can't sustain the, the deployment tempo that you would like, do you shrink the Marine Corps or do you become less maritime? What choice do you see uh, in that sure. instance? Well, we'd prefer to work with the Navy to find a sustainable amphibious warship fleet level that would allow us to continue to deploy and, and meet, you know, the, the combatant commander's requirements. There are a variety of other ways you can approach it. You can look at, you can look at capabilities that don't uh, require you to use amphibious warships. Uh, we don't, as a general rule, like that because those ships are not built to go under fire. In fact, in many cases, there are legal requirements that limit what you can do with them under fire. So that's not a desired case for the Marine Corps, and I want to I want to emphasize that. Nonetheless, you can look you can look at those alternatives. Uh, the special purpose MAGTAF that we're looking to potentially move out here in the near future is initially, at least, going to be land based. And the the range, the flexibility, the versatility of the V-22 Osprey gives you remarkable capabilities uh, in, in an area, for example, like the Mediterranean, the North African littoral, the Levant. Uh, you can centrally position something and reach a lot of different places with a V-22. Now, obviously, a V-22 is not going to give you the capability that you're going to get coming from the sea uh, off an amphibious platform. Nonetheless, for a variety of missions, the, we can still fill those with a V-22. So in answer to your question, you know, as we go into, you know, in, in the months ahead, as the budget picture begins to, fi it begins to firm up, and as we get into the QDR, we'll be working closely with the Navy on the, on the size and number of amphibious warships. It is safe to say that is a matter of great interest to us. I think we're going to have to have Marines learn how to deploy on uh, strategic ballistic missile submarines. <laughs> the only ships they'll have left. All right. <sighs> An emerging topic that seems to be of great importance to the Army, and I think we'd be interested to hear what your perspective on it is, this idea that increasingly uh, forces deployed ashore will have to operate in more uh, WMD environments, and it's a, it's a skill that's somewhat atrophied, one might actually say, for the forces over the last dozen or so years. Um, so th there's, the, there's both the ability to operate in CBRN environments as well as the ability to respond to the loss of control over CBRN assets and how the Marine Corps views both operating in the environment and the potential mission to have to seize them. Sure, that's a, uh, that's a task that a Marine Expeditionary Area Unit is capable, <laughs> capable of executing. Uh, you know, over the last 12 years, while we have deployed large forces to the CENTCOM AOR to fight two land wars, we have still maintained new deployments outside the the CENTCOM AOR, and those forces have had that capability. Now, it, obviously, the force has been focused on other things, the, the force writ large. Uh, those are skills that you can pick back up, not immediately, but fairly quickly, because they're essentially CBR and defense is essentially a, a trainable mechanical skill that you can, e you, you know, you can, easily, uh, you can easily put back into a unit. 
uh, we will we are interested in working the WMD issue. Like I said, MUSE are already part of that part of that solution. Obviously, special operations forces play a significant role in that as well. And as we go forward, we're going to look to continue and increase our integration with special operations forces as well. So we think it's an area that, that we're going to be interested in exploring. Let's do one more, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, sir, you talked about the uh, evolution of getting to a good set of requirements on the amphibious combat vehicle. And I'm wondering if the Marine Corps feels like uh, you've had enough opportunity to have an open level of dialogue with industry to both understand the cost trade-offs and the implications of different requirement trade space and, um, and also some uh, where their uh, risks and opportunities are. Um, so has that been have you been able to have the dialogue that you think that you need in order to get to the requirements that you want? We think we have to have that dialogue to have any chance at all of producing a useful vehicle, and it's continuing now. It is not yet complete. But that, that process, that dialogue with industry is continuing. Look, it's an extremely, it's an exquisitely complex vehicle. It's got to come from the sea at whatever speed you finally want it to come at. It's got to be able to, to transition ashore, and it's got to be able to, to, to move Marines around on shore. Now, we don't see it as a probably as a Bradley competitor, not fighting, you know, not fighting pure combat vehicles ashore. But nonetheless, that's a pretty stiff order to put on a vehicle. So we want to get it right, and that requires extensive discussion with industry, and that's ongoing now. Well, General, you came in here today to kick us off in this discussion series on the QDR. I think you've not only reflected on a lot of the issues that are relevant for the United States Marine Corps in that process, but as well on the broader QDR process and the challenges that DOD faces. I think those of us who look at it from the outside can see the complexities, um, but sometimes have a harder time seeing the solutions. And, uh, and you've explored some of those options with us today as well. So I want to thank you on behalf of CSIS and, and uh, for being here with us today. I want to again acknowledge uh, our gratitude to our sponsor, uh, Rolls-Royce North America, for making these forums possible. And I want to invite you back when you've got more answers and you can come back and tell us what they are. David, thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Appreciate it. It's a delight.